Um, in, in the discussion we're, we're going to have, uh, the, the format's going to be pretty simple. We want to, to get uh, our experts here to be talking about, uh, give us some baseline to start, and then it's going to be a discussion first among us, and then we encourage all of you to be participating in this discussion. As we said at the outset, we we're looking to try and get our way to some solutions, and this is going to be an opportunity to help us do that. So we're, we're very pleased to begin with this first part of the uh, uh, GAM Summit this year, Cloud-Based Manufacturing, Who's Going to Rule the Clouds? Uh, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, starting on my left, uh, Dr. Shiwan Lin is the co-chair of the Architect uh, Task Force in the Industrial Internet Consortium, where he's a leading contributor to the Industrial Internet Reference Architecture. He has two decades of accumulated experience in industrial IoT systems, uh, big data and big data analytics, enterprise software, cloud services systems, security and trust, telecommunications and wireless data communication in both large corporations and start startup uh, systems. And that would be enough of a job, but he has a day job. <laughs> and his day job, he's the CEO and co-founder of ThingsWise LLC, a company providing IIoT data processing and analytics uh, platforms. Next to him is Rob McGreevy, the Vice President of Operations, Information, and Asset Management for Schneider Electric. Rob's responsible for uh, defining and executing the software product and business strategy. That business focuses on industrial information management, enterprise data management, IIoT, and cloud and mobile applications. And finally, Rich Carpenter, the Product General Manager for GE's Automation and Controls product platform with a worldwide distribution and deployment capabilities for their control system, operator interface, industrial PC, field agent industrial internet products. Uh, the control system product line is used throughout GE and their large equipment and plant controls for power generation and oil and gas business. To get this discussion started, uh, I wanted to have Dr. Lin, from his perspective on both of his day jobs, to talk a little bit about where we're at on the in, uh, open architecture for industrial Internet of Things. If we just uh, come down here, it's easier to talk. Um, so I um, just want to add, you know, I, before I uh, um, uh, um, start this uh, things wise, I've been working for Intel for 10 years, last served as technologist for its IoT um, strategy and technology office. So uh, today I'm honored to have the opportunity to hear, uh, here to share some of my thoughts on the industrial internet and want to br bring to you uh, a brief update on some of the effort and result uh, on uh, uh, establishing some open architectures concerning industrial internet. So today, uh, to start it, let's you know, uh, touch on the topic, what is industrial internet? Uh, I'm sure everybody have your notion of what industrial internet is about. To me, industrial internet is about uh, extending the internet so connectedness to the thing, to the device, to the machine, to connect between them, to connect among them, to connect them with the information system, with the business process, and with the people who work with them. Built on top of this uh, connectedness, a main theme of the industrial internet is about collecting a large amount of data from the assets from the business process, from the manufacturing process, and apply advanced analytics on this data to gain insights, and apply the insight back to the operation to enable intelligence operation at the end for delivering new business values. Now, there's another way. Um, well, I, I guess I forgot to uh, turn this one here. This right one here, okay. So essentially, the idea is Build on connectedness, collect data, apply advanced analytics, gain insights to enable intelligent operation to deliver new business values. Now, another way to look at uh, industrial internet is to consider it as the convergence between the operation technology, in our case here, manufacturing technology with the latest information technology. And more specifically is to look at, well, I guess you know, these are not really working really well for me, the, to connect the assets, the control systems, the operational system, or the manufacturing systems with the latest uh, informational technology in big data, in advanced analytics, and connect them all together with the business process to enable uh, intelligent operations. Obviously, the topic of the convergence between OT and IT is a, not a new one. There's a well-recognized challenge uh, in the, how to bring these two sides together. However, I believe if we can um, 
adapt, optimize, and simplify the latest information technology, bring them together as a platform solutions based on the operational requirements for the purpose of solving operational problems, we may ease this uh, important convergence. However, industrial operation systems or manufacturing system are complex systems. It may require several uh, platform technologies put together in order to solve any particular problems. To make that work well, I believe um, a sheer architecture model, well-defined faces, is uh, highly desirable for putting different technologies together to solve the real-world problems. Now, I see the Industrial Internet Consortium has recognized this importance of this uh, challenge and has been putting in a lot of effort in identifying the common architecture models or common architecture patterns across different industrial sectors concerning the Industrial Internet of Things and want to um, produce an um, open, standard-based uh, cross-industrial reference architecture to um, promote the consensus on architecture models to guide the development of interoperable technologies uh, from different vendors and to serve as a common starting point of system design at the end to encourage reuse of technologies across different industrial sectors, including manufacturing as well. Um, again, the purpose to reduce IoT development effort, risk, cost, and time to productions. Now, because industrial Internet of Things covers such a broad field, there's many parallel efforts going on developing architectures. And IEC also engage in the activity of trying to harmonize different architecture efforts. Um, uh, one of the significant ones uh, is concerning with Rami 4.0. Many of you are familiar with the industrial 4.0 effort going on in Germany. And one of the key uh, collaboration between these two groups is to look at the two different uh, reference architectures or reference framework to figure out how do they map, how do they relate to each other, where they complement, and how do they interact. Suppose you build an operational system based on the industrial internet reference architecture, and then you, in manufacturing floor, you build a system based on uh, Rami 4.0. How do these two systems interact? For example, for the, as a manufacturer, you want to collect real-world usage data on your product and deploy in the field, right? In order to help you to uh, help you on the en engineering process, how does this? How do this system can interact together? And finally, what technology can they share, right, to encourage you to reuse? Uh, to avoid reinventing the wheel again and again for each industrial sectors. So this is the topic that we are also looking at as well. So with that, hopefully we can touch on some of the points in our discussion and uh, hand it back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Yuan, and thanks very much for the, uh, the opportunity to get, uh, get our discussion started. Um, Rob, I'm going to start with you. Talk about the platform for IIoT it, from two perspectives. One, let's talk about platform as you see it from Schneider Electric's perspective and some of the things you're working on. And the idea that the, we talk about it as a singular thing, but it, it's, there, there are, are variants to it as we go along. But let's start your, your view of the IIoT platform from Schneider Electric's perspective. Sure, so before we jump kind of right into the platform, as, as Shiwan mentioned, essentially we're talking about a, a, a huge change in the industry around IIoT. And, and for us, it really comes down to new value streams or so-called value streams that people actually get out of this, this proliferation of technologies and changes. And we think there's a whole range of things around quality, production, performance, and other things we'll talk about in a little bit here um, that are essentially going to be manifest through a whole range of new applications um, that are essentially delivered by capturing high fidelity process production data and basically a whole new range of low-cost sensing. Okay? We also see, as, as was presented a few minutes ago, we think there's going to be essentially a collapsing of the level one, two, and three space that we all traditionally kind of know if you're, you're sort of in this space, the so-called SCADA HMI, the traditional DCS space. There'll be sort of a flattening of all that. And so what's essentially going to be enabled by that are these different platforms, these so-called platforms that we hear that will enable this range of applications, that will enable these range of solutions, and will essentially tie together all this uh, sort of craziness that's going to go on, which we'll, we'll hopefully elaborate on in a minute here. 
So from our perspective, we provide a range of different platforms um, around information, asset performance, reliability, real-time systems that essentially are built specifically to enable a broad range of very open, a very open systems approach to delivering those specific applications, like, for example, predictive asset analytics or like specifically enterprise asset performance management, those things delivered on top of that platform essentially deliver the value streams. Um, so from our perspective, it's a series of these platforms that essentially are, are key to enabling that. But again, the platform piece is only, it's sort of anti into the game. It's these applications and solutions that you really need to spend time talking about. And again, we'll, we'll probably articulate a bit more of that uh, in a minute here. Absolutely. Rich, same kind of thing from, from GE's perspective. Uh, you guys launched Predix over the last year and started to talk about that in a, in a very real sense as a platform off of which some of the applications Rob just talked about are, are, are going to be built. Can you talk about GE's view of uh, the platform and, and how you see it manifesting itself? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, Predix is definitely something that's in the press. It's a critical part of our strategy. I would describe it as, you know, the industrial cloud part of the architecture. But I think you gotta take a step back and say, well, why are we embarked on that? The context for us is when we're one of the largest OEMs on the planet. We ship $60 billion worth of equipment in a yearly basis, and that's high value equipment that we're responsible for servicing. We also have 450 some odd manufacturing plants, spend $50 billion a year in those plants. How do we drive efficiencies in those two sets of operations? So the first thing we had to do is be willing to disrupt ourselves because the traditional approach we felt was not gonna to continue to work. Too complicated, too many different systems, too much integration, too much connectivity between them, et cetera. So we sort of settled on really the world is gonna to move to a cloud edge architecture. There's a set of things that are gonna run in the cloud and they have to run in the cloud because they need a big data infrastructure. They need an elastic compute environment. You need to be able to operate at an ecosystem level to be able to get the benefits to an individual plant. But it has to still run at the plant. And the reason it has to run at the plant is you got real time deterministic control on pieces of equipment that if they don't run at the same rate every single 10 millisecond interval, they start to crash into things or they start to destroy themselves. So you have to have an environment that supports both the cloud and the edge in a very synergistic way. And so Predix is built on the concept that you're gonna put the right logic, the right optimization in the right place of the architecture. If it's running in the cloud, it's probably because it's operating at an ecosystem level and it's using advanced analytics. If it's running at the plant level, it's because you're optimizing a series of processes that operate across equipment that goes throughout the plant. If it's running right next to the equipment in order to optimize the way that piece of equipment is running, but now based on business information, not just the sensor input, then it's gonna run close to the machine where you can affect the way that operates on a day-to-day -day basis. Great. All of that has to operate in a very secure environment, and so we see security as a first-class citizen in that world. Juwan, are these two concepts mutually exclusive? Are they complementary, or are we talking about, I, I, I'm one of the few people in the room old enough to remember, are we talking about Betamax versus VHS? What, what is the relationship between kind of an open architecture and a, a system more along the lines of Predix? Um, I, I'm not sure they are precluding each other. I think, you know, even in the, under the uh, Predix uh, framework, I mean, um, you, you are talking about a range of uh, 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 architecture elements uh, from the cloud to the manufacturing floor and, and uh, from edge to the cloud, you know, the uh, analytic uh, can be distributed and depend on the time horizon of the analytic and the control. Um, a different element need to be distributed across this architecture, and I, I believe you know uh, 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 also you know um, um, appreciate the, uh, the 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 desirability of you know uh, open architecture, right. and different components can fit into the open architecture in order to deliver the end-to-end -end solutions. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I think that's a very good point. Yeah. The thing I would just add to that is that you know Predix is an open system, but I wouldn't consider it a public cloud. It's a cloud that's more like a gated community so that we can do security checks on the people that come in in order to protect all of our customers' equipment and their sites. And so we're very careful on a security standpoint, and I would say it uses open architecture technologies, but in a very secure way. And, and Rob, that's really a very different concept than, than what you were just talking about. Can you kind of yeah. elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, I, I think what, so what we deal with is a lot of the volume stuff. So I know as, as Rich mentioned, you know, GE's working on things specific to GE, which makes perfect sense. Schneider is the same way. We've got manufacturing sites all over. Um, but a, a great deal of our business and focus as a software business is around 
basically the masses of applications and industries that we have across infrastructure and manufacturing. So we look very broadly at everything that's in water, wastewater, power, utilities, what do they need? Same thing on the manufacturing side, whether it's drug products or you know, food and beverage, there's a whole set of different capabilities that those industries need. That necessitates a whole lot of open standards and basically open platforms because those are extremely heterogeneous manufacturing environments. They've got PLCs, RTUs, DCSC systems from all sorts of vendors. That necessitates an open interoperability. Um, a lot of the systems and sources that feed these advanced applications come from an ecosystem of partners, planning, scheduling, optimization, um, that, that, that are uh, you know, outside of the four walls of a lot of companies. So uh, there's certainly pros and cons, uh, certainly to each one of these things. I would suggest that you know, the broader you go in terms of a pure software play, providing these advanced applications, it's gonna necessitate more devices, more controls, more interoperability. It's gonna, it's gonna require much more system level integration with things that we traditionally don't deal with. Um, for example, just feeding in weather, weather data as a part of uh, manufacturing operations or cost of energy or assay data from, from looking at planning and scheduling for crude. These are all very, very disparate sources and without standards, without an open platform, it's kind of hard to deliver that. The other feedback that we've gotten is that a lot of our customers on the commercial side want flexibility. And so the minute you have a more of an open standard, you, you basically have a little more flexibility commercially about who you want to pick. If you want to pick a Rockwell controller or a Siemens controller or a, or a Schneider Electric controller, fine, so be it. Or similarly, with this explosion of IoT devices, there are dozens and dozens of vendors out there shipping low-cost kind of wireless sensing technologies. And so from our perspective, we want to continue to capitalize on that high-volume area uh, that we serve across both those industries. And, and do you see this being uh, not just a, a, the horizontal discussion of IIoT, but also specific solutions for vertical markets throughout the, uh, throughout the industries? Absolutely. That, and that's why I kind of alluded to earlier. That is where the game is. I mean, yes, you've got to have connectivity and, and security and all these things. Well, I don't want to uh, disparage or play that down, but that's anti into the game. Got to connect, got to store, and you have to make sure these things are secure. But the values manifest in these applications and solutions. Uh, and so those are vertical in nature, absolutely. So from our perspective, we look at, okay, what are the key areas of the applications that we see in the so-called IoT space? And we can talk, talk about different ones, but as an example, uh, Rich alluded to it, you know, predictive asset analytics, which is something that's become quite in the headlines for us. That's a very good example of something that we see both in the oil and gas industry and the power industry. And it's been changed dramatically by, uh, by IoT, in particular in one area. That is, it's super low-cost sensing devices that we can now feed into high-fidelity process production historians and run against those uh, predictive asset models to essentially predict failure rates and optimize performance, okay? That's uh, it's a mouthful of sort of tech jargon and, and uh, you know, I guess uh, complexity, but there's a lot of use cases and summaries that, uh, that are out there that show you how companies that have done this uh, have been able to reap uh, significant, really, really significant advantages. In fact, there's one, um, a case study was presented uh, almost a year ago by a company called Duke Energy that saved around $30 million, $31 million in cost avoidance, specifically by implementing new sensing, low cost, feeding into high fidelity historians and running predictive asset analytic models off it. That's a perfect case in point where how the IoT world, all this sort of cloud, high fidelity data is all kind of coming to fruition. Yeah, and, and, and Rich, I, I want you to follow up on that as well because it's, the goals are both the same. It's the, the, the do, you, do you drive around the, the community or do you drive through it? And I guess that's the, the, the question that we're kind of talking about here. Yeah, I think you have to be a little bit careful about thinking of GE as just a hardware company today. Yeah. We formed a business called GE Digital. If you look at GE in aggregate, it's probably in the top 12 software companies in the world today mm -hmm. based on the total volume across the different products. We're absolutely in the middle of a, a disruption to bring an app economy to industrial. And, and that's going to happen the same way it happened in the consumer space. And so we see that as a critical part of the element. I, I think what's different, though, is we're rethinking the traditional applications. Like MES, 12, 18-month project, customize it so that it fits perfectly within the plant. We view that as old school. I mean, it's great. The plant's happy, but it doesn't work across the enterprise. So we used to do that. I mean, put my hand up. Yeah, we're guilty. We would do five plants a year. We have 450. Do you know how many years it takes to do 450 plants at five a year? So today, what we're looking at is 100 plants a year. And to do that, we may only get 70% of the benefit, but we'll get it across 100% of the plants, and we'll do that very, very rapidly. This is where IoT comes in. We can come in, we can instrument that plant in days. Within two days after that plant is instrumented, you've got reports that are coming out. 
Contrast that to the traditional approach of developing a big MES type system, installing it across the board, interacting with all the users, getting all the requirements, writing in the customizations. So I would say we're a fan of standardization. We're a fan of consistency across the enterprise. We're a fan of moving quickly versus, you know, what I would say perfectly. And that speed is part of the industrial internet culture. Absolutely. I want to go to something that uh, Shiwan talked about in, in his opening remarks, and that's this idea of operations and, and IT having to, uh, to come together. This has been, as, we, as I said at the outset, kind of the uh, oil and water of, of manufacturing for a long, long time. And if any of these things that we're talking about here are going to come to pass, that is one of the first barriers that has to come down. I'd like all of you to talk about that, but Shiwan, can you elaborate a little bit on, on what's happening with operations in IT and what needs to happen? Um, I guess there's a, a traditional, you know, uh, there's a number of barriers you know, from cultures, from requirements, from, you know, skill set, from the, uh, the, the technologies. Um, but I guess, you know, some of them had to um, uh, change by, you know, break down some of the organizational barrier. You, you probably heard that a lot already, right? But I, I'm from technology side. I think you know, the, we need to turn the table around and say, hey, IT is a need to serve OT, right? To bring the latest IT technologies, serve your customer in OT, and based on OT requirements. And one way to do that is to package the core IT technology into an easy, deployable platform and offer uh, to the uh, uh, OT uh, uh, side to, to use. And, and um, so, so I guess you know, the, the, the question is, uh, how do we achieve that, right? I mean, uh, with an open platform, open architecture, we enable that you know, to some, some good extent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we want to take it one step yeah. further beyond that, Rob. I mm -hmm. think one of the things that uh, Shiwan alluded to is that IT wants to deliver a, a finished product, a, a finished package, to the operations people, but they don't always know what the operations people want, need, or will be able to operate effectively. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I, I would say, well, first off, um, I think gone are the days where these two camps, the so-called uh, you know, back office IT groups and, and engineering sort of operate independently. Honestly, I think gone are those days. We, more and more of the meetings and sessions and planning that we do, they're in the same room in the same, you know, same environment, and that, has, that will stay. I think what has to happen, first off, is, Oh, and it's, it's funny how it's evolved over the past 20 years, but uh, IT, it, and these are general statements, which always get me in trouble, by the way, yeah. but uh, in general, IT uh, doesn't have as much of an appreciation, I would say, a profound appreciation for what goes on on the engineering side, the high fidelity controls, just the complexity of, of what sort of exists down there. Um, and similarly, on the flip side, uh, the, you know, the operations or engineering side of the businesses generally don't have as much of a sense for what's happening on issues like cyber, et cetera. So both camps have to get a little smarter about each other. Right. And essentially, to deliver on the promise of a lot of this IoT, you absolutely have to marry up the engineering side, and we have to produce products. Uh, but there's no way that can be done in absence of IT. Yeah. So in general, those two camps have to come together. Um, and I do think that the, uh, everyone, in general, has come to the, the same conclusion. And Rich mentioned about MES is a great example of just sort of monolithic approaches to things. Um, it's a lighter weight approach is something that both IT wants and, I, and the uh, engineering side wants. So again, my, my summary would be both teams have to get in the room, get a little bit smarter about both sides of, of, the, of, the, of the fence, so to speak. Yeah, sometimes they go skipping happily down the aisle, sometimes the shotgun wedding, but in either case, you've got to get that, uh, that process moving. Rich, yeah. your perspective on that? So I'd say what we see happening is that uh, traditional IT is changing. Systems are going to cloud. I mean, whoever thought we'd have our um, you know, customer databases sitting in the cloud, our financial information sitting in the cloud. As all that information moves to the cloud, the IT departments aren't fighting as many fires. That's left to the people that have those systems. And now they're sitting back saying, well, okay, what's my role in the company? And a result of that is they're realizing they have to partner more closely with the operational technologies. There's no question about that. On the other hand, you've got the operational side that's, you know, they hear the word Hadoop and Cassandra, and these things just are like, what are you talking about? These are terms that, that I don't even understand. They're not in my repertoire. And yet you're telling me I need big data and Hadoop and Cassandra in order to run advanced analytics to get IoT type benefits. So the two worlds are coming together out of a need and out of an available capacity. And they can solve problems that, that I promise you, if you start an IoT initiative and you get information connected and you start looking at that data, you're going to find solutions to problems you didn't even know existed but you're gonna to need to bring both groups of experience, the domain expertise 
and the technology expertise in the same room in order to discover those insights. Uh, Rich, I want to go back to you on this one because we want to start to talk about uh, that thing I mentioned at the outset about moving the discussion from theoretical to practical. You don't have to get into specific company names, but can you give us some examples of how some of GE's customers are using uh, IIoT strategies in one way or another to start to affect some real change within their facilities? Yeah, I would say that uh, you know we're a consumer ourselves, and we're a provider within our customer base. And you know we've uh, we've now developed a set of capabilities through what we call a field agent. And a field agent is an industrial app platform, but it's also an industrial connectivity platform. So we can take the information using standard open protocols, bring it to a cloud environment, do some crunching on it, but it can also run locally, to your point, based on the time constraints, the, the different applications. And so a traditional control system, automation systems we all know, they sort of have this see, think, do loop is the way I would look at it. You have your standard inputs, you run your logic, you set some output, that controls actuators, which controls equipment. That's great, but what we valued in the past, I would say, was unchanging consistency runs the same way every time. What we really want to do today in an IoT context is see, think, do, but then have an optimized loop that runs outside of it. And so some of our customers, what they might do is that optimized loop running asynchronously might go up to the cloud, might get the current forecast for electricity pricing over the next 12 hours. And instead of running that pump at 10 a.m. every morning like they typically do to move this lake from here to there, they wait until it's 2.30 in the afternoon because that's the best time to run it according to the price of energy. And they're saving millions of dollars through those types of relatively simple applications, but very profound in terms of changing see, think, do to include an optimization loop that's driven through the IoT infrastructure. Rob, you, you, sure. you've got, again, you've got, as we talked about with Jack Nalig's presentation earlier, you guys are on both sides of the fence. You're uh, a supplier to the industry and you're a big manufacturer on the marketplace. Right. What are you seeing internally from, sure. from Schneider Electric as well as what, what are you seeing from your customer base? Sure. What are they sure. asking for? Sure, so internally, again, similar, we, uh, we, we drink our own champagne, as we like to say, so we <laughs> use our software um, to help our manufacturing operations. So an example is that Schneider Electric provides, as probably you know, a lot of electromechanical equipment, uh, meters, um, you know, switch gear, things like that, uh, across the businesses. And so what we've done is essentially digitize those things. We have connected those uh, hard assets into our software infrastructure so that we can monitor and maintain it on behalf of our customers. So as opposed to just selling them electromechanical stuff, we can provide a maintenance uh, and a team on that and actually run predictive analytics and other things on behalf of them, to provide them additional value. So that's how we're using our own stuff in this uh, IoT connected world. What enabled that is the high fidelity process production data we can capture from the stuff that we produce and then running it into our, uh, our environment where we do analytics, et cetera. Now, from the outside looking in, as I mentioned, we, we deal with a lot of other industries uh, across the uh, different infrastructure and manufacturing segments. So a couple examples, uh, just pick a few random ones. In, in the power industry in particular, there's been a, a tremendous amount of focus around asset performance and reliability. Very specifically, when, when these assets fail, it's a big deal. People get hurt. Uh, there's millions and millions of dollars of damage done when turbines and things uh, have issues. And so we've, we have a, a couple case studies where our clients essentially have outfitted their equipment with additional sensing technology, low-cost sensing that you'd see um, today that's, uh, you know, geez, one-tenth of the cost of the traditional proprietary type systems that are out there. They feed that into a, a high fidelity environment that run our predictive analytics off of it, and they're able to reap benefits from it. And again, there's a couple of case studies out there that are fairly well published. The, these, this industry has what they call catches, where they will literally catch five to $10 million worth of present, preventive failures in a year. So these systems pay for themselves you know, very, very quickly. Now on the tr more traditional manufacturing side, um, there's, there's a lot of very interesting ones. Uh, New Belgian breweries comes to mind. They, these are, they're making beer, and I thought, thought I'd bring that one up because it's a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're very, as a company, they make a great product, uh, and uh, they obviously are also very much into sustainability. If you're familiar with New Belgium or the Fat Tire brand of beers, the company's very much into sustainability. They have uh, essentially optimized their manufacturing process, and they have a lot of what we would consider cogen. They actually run uh, very uh, green or earth-friendly engine um, electrical um, supply. They run solar and other things to help offset energy consumption or reduce their footprint. So they have tied into their manufacturing processes not only the operational pieces through sensors and controllers, but they're tying in energy, um, alternative energy sources as a way to sort of help them optimize manufacturing. 
So that's another example of where they're sort of tying these things in for a, for a, for a, a sort of an energy one. On the CPG food bev side, pharmaceuticals, another one where um, if, you're, if you don't follow that industry too closely, there's a lot of emphasis around what they call serialization. It's essentially producing in unit level tracking, so not pallet or bulk tracking of, of, of drug products, but actually at the unit level between manufacturing and out to the pharmaceutical sites or the um, drugstores and chains and such. So serialization is another example where you're doing high fidelity capture uh, using a lot of these devices and actually building that into your supply chain so you can do traceability and other things on it. So from our perspective, again, we, we deal with a very broad range of, of applications that are you know, a, very, a little bit different for each industry. And what really it comes down to is what are the key value areas they're trying to achieve, right? Is it um, you know, counterfeits in drugs? Is it quality and consistency of, of manufactured food products? Uh, or is it you know, energy consumption or safety and reliability? We look at those dimensions, and then we have a series of applications that are enabled by that, that realm of things. So hopefully that gives you a sense for some uh, examples. Absolutely. Had I known you were going to mention Fat Tire, I would have asked for samples for our audience <laughs> this afternoon. But maybe later. Maybe, maybe later. later. Uh, Shiwan, you, you deal with this from, from the, the customer perspective. What are some of the things that you're hearing from your customers in terms of both what do, what do I need to know about IIoT and then how do I implement mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps I'll give a one, one concrete example uh, from a customer we work with. Um, uh, the, this particular customer is, in, uh, is a manufacturer of uh, uh, water pumps uh, for pressurized water to high-rise uh, buildings. And unlike America, residential area, you know, usually have two-story buildings or, or some, you know, apartment buildings, five, six. But in Asia, uh, residential uh, buildings tend to be 20 or 30 story high, and each of those buildings have a group of pumps press water up uh, to maintain constant pressure for water supply or for the residents. And you know, uh, this particular manufacturer is in a highly competitive environment, and there's many competitions there. Um, what, they, uh, what we work with them is really to apply the industrial internet idea to be able to connect to those pumps that have been deployed in the field, gather data from them, gather operational data from them, and apply analytics to those pumps, operation data, to identify potential uh, 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 faults and actually to optimize the pump's operation. You know, the four part actually the traditional, you know, the well-known uh, 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 solution for predictive maintenance. And, and we also want to be able to optimize the operation of the pump to maintain uh, 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 water supplies during peak hours. For example, you know, some building may have a large water tank. In that case, during, uh, prior to the peak hour, you may want to, you know, uh, uh, fill up the, the, the water tank you know, uh, prior to peak hour, and then you know, for those buildings, you don't have water, water tank, right? You know, you're a smaller one, you actually you know, use the pump to pressurize water. So, so from, and also they want to um, uh, uh, optimize uh, the storage of water based on usage patterns, based on weather, or so based on events, or holidays, or not, to maintain the maximum uh, uh, freshness in the water. So you don't want to have the water stay in the tank for too long a time. So, so that, that's all these things we, that uh, we, we are working on. Um, however, that's not it. I mean, they want to apply these sets of technologies and turn them around, offer this service back to the water supply uh, 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 management company or water supply authorities. Now, they, are, they, they want to use these transforming the business model from a simple equipment uh, supplier to a service provider as well, mm -hmm. and to change their competition profile in the market sector. So this is, uh, I think, is a, one, a good example of right. how to use the idea of industrial internet to transform your business model, to move your competition to the next level. And that's interesting because Schneider Electric has done the same thing from the electrical side, but it's interesting. I have not heard that example from the water side, so that's a fascinating, uh, a fascinating use case. We're going to want to start to open this up to questions. Erin over here has got the microphone, so if you've got some questions, uh, please uh, put your hand up and she'll come around. Uh, as, as a starting point uh, to move into some of the, the audience questions, um, we want to talk about, as we said at the outset, what are the things manufacturers should begin? If there's one thing or two things that you could say, we want to get going on this, where should manufacturing begin in terms of implementing IoT on a platform? Shiwan? I guess, you know, the, uh, I think the plant managers, you know, will be in the driver's seat. And these, the folk, uh, you're the folk that actually know 
what is your biggest problem today you're facing in your operation, whether it's you know, a throughput or production uh, uh, qualities or, or inventory or, or downtimes. You know, pick some of those uh, simple problem or easy to solve problem and try to apply the idea or technology in the industrial internet into solving some of the simple idea, the low hanging fruit that provide a maximum business value back to your operation first. Because in Dutch internet, it's not something that you can deploy in one shot in you know, over a few months or a few, a few weeks or a year, and then you're done with it. This will be a continuing improvement process. You're getting higher and higher in the level of uh, 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 providing business value. You need to start early and with some concrete uh, 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 project that can provide, you know, approve business value back to your, 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 your operations. And, and then beyond that, incrementally improving it, you know, chain forming from initially just, you know, gaining, gaining the um, a holistic view of how the assets are operating in your floor to uh, implementing predictive maintenance, reduce runtime, to optimize your production, optimize utilization or throughput, and then gradually coordinating your operation across factory plants, right? And even globally, finally, go one step further to increase the intelligence in, in your operation within the machine themselves, essentially transforming your operation from uh, automation to autonomy. Mm -hmm. But this is going to take years to achieve, but you need to start sometime sooner than later yeah. to get started. You want to get some early victories and, yes. and, and build off of those. <laughs> Rob, you, you, you've seen the same thing as that we, we, we talk about not just getting victories for the sake of dollars and cents, but it also helps uh, as you're doing transformative things in your operational side, it gets some champions within your own facilities. That's right, it does. And I think what I would add too is uh, not only, uh, perfect point about, be specific about some specific business areas that you're targeting, whether it's quality, performance, et cetera. Drill that down to something specific. Um, the thing I would suggest is, you know, there's a lot of companies out there doing some pretty cool progressive things. And a lot of them more and more these days are willing to share. And so there's case studies of people that have done performance optimization or reliability-centered maintenance or, you know, pick your, your topic um, and, and learn a little bit from that. Then work it into some very narrow, you know, specific use cases and, and pilots and POCs. Don't be afraid to spend a little money on getting a pilot or a POC going in the areas that you've identified. Um, and then I think it was Jack earlier mentioned on his opening, you know, get a, get a new fresh team. Don't be afraid to have a mix of perspectives on the team, some fresh new uh, ideas plus a lot of folks that maybe have been in the industry and have the experience, um, but but that's how I suggest people get started on this. Yeah, and, and Rich, you talked about this from GE's large perspective, plants all over the world doing many kinds of different things. But it's it's beginning the process of identifying where do we have where do we have the need to make some changes. Sometimes those are identified, uh, they identify themselves, but also. Where, do, where can we have some opportunity to get some quick victories and, and, and drive some uh, enthusiasm within the organization? Yeah, so erring on the side of fast value is absolutely critical because you have to get some wins to get the support of the organization, full stop. I mean, completely agree with that. Yeah. The thing I would add, though, is uh, there's an element of a leap of faith. So what we always tell people is get yourself connected because a lot of the equipment is not connected today. Data is a little bit like oil in the ground. It has future value. You don't use necessarily the Six Sigma techniques in the big data environment. They work fine for what data should I collect, what problem am I trying to solve, how do I put a control in place. They don't work very well on, well, what are the insights in this data that I haven't discovered yet? For that, we had to bring on board some data engineers and some data scientists. That's a skill set we didn't have before, honestly. We had to bring on board some user experience people who worked with the operators exactly like you described well, let me watch how you do your job. Let me understand the kind of problems that you're having. And those three skills together, looking at the data, understanding the pain points in the operation, really led us to derive the insights and help our customers drive the insights that then we could put in place on a permanent basis. So take that leap of faith, understand it's gonna take you in directions that you don't know today, but that's the point of this, to change the equation from declining productivity industrial from 4% to 1%, versus 19% in consumer, to turn that equation around, we've got to adopt these kind of technologies and take a little bit of a leap of faith and understand that with the right skill sets, we can change the total approach. Do we have some questions out in the audience? 
right over here. IIoT is that it allows progress even though there's an installed base and even though there's a lot of legacy systems there and that there's a, there's a way forward as it were. Um, and, but at the same time you are talking about flattening the automation triangle so that there's the cloud level and there's the sensor level. Somebody loses out there. Where does the resistance come? Where does do the questions about, well, okay, we put on all these sensors and you tell us in two years we're going to notice patterns, but, but how do we know that? So, so if you just talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the challenges as far as actually working with people who have money to invest. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll throw in a couple of points. I'm sure that you guys have some additional, but um, equipment goes into a plant and it stays there for 20 years. That reality is not going to change. And so you have to operate in an environment where there may be some equipment that, that's already there. We can design the new equipment for optimization, but the existing equipment we have to work side by side with. So the kind of IoT devices that we put in place might be attached to the new controllers, might be independent for the existing controllers so that they can interact with it directly and run sort of in parallel. A great example of that in some of our manufacturing plants, not just ours, but our customers, they used to be limited to the sensors that came through the controllers into the historian, and that's what they did for their analysis. And now to Rob's point, you can put a whole bunch of low-cost sensors in place, and you can bring that data in in parallel and independent of the control system. You don't have to open up the beast and close it back up anymore to do that. And you can bring all of that information to these big data environments, and big data just means new techniques. It doesn't mean that you have hundreds of terabytes of data. It's just that there's some technologies that, that help you manipulate the data differently, where then you can start to tease those insights out of the data in weeks and months. It's not years to do that. Yeah, I just want to add, uh, yeah, so I, as, as Rich said, you know, shadow, shadow sensors are what we sometimes refer to them as. They're basically sitting on top of shadowing the existing sensing and, and controls equipment. Um, I think that's one thing that will happen. The only thing, I, and Rich had mentioned it, I think, a little early in the discussion, the, the collapsing that we see is going to be over time. It's not going to be a, a day where we just, you know, the certain systems shut off, right, and the other ones kind of begin. And what we've actually seen is an adoption rate where you, the closer you are to kind of reporting and analytics, sort of the further you away from critical control, the more attractive these technologies, these approaches are. And as you start to work your way back the spectrum to the high fidelity production control where it's safety, safety related systems or you know, microsecond control or millisecond control, the less likely those applications are. So those things will largely stay in place and we'll look to shadow those. So I think it'll be a gradual thing over time. But I would think of it today as an in addition to, not necessarily an instead of control, that will change over time. Uh, control strategies and other things. Uh, will certainly change over time, but it's going to be a gradual process, I think. Questions? Right over here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, one, one situation I face often as the customers is that, yeah, we have a lot of data, but they are in different databases, and then it's hard to work on those correlations, so to find the right data, do the correlations, do the data analy uh, analytics. So, uh, for example, in GE, do you have already strategies how to store data or, for example, put them in the cloud and do then or improve the data analysis? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, some of our plants had 50 different databases and you're trying to get correlations across these databases. It can be a nightmare. And honestly, we've been through multiple approaches to this problem. So we went to a data lake approach. We brought all the information into a common environment and tried to normalize it. Somewhat that worked, other ways it didn't work. But when we really started to make progress is after we hired a set of data engineers. It's a new skill set. You know, there's probably only 40% of the world's need in terms of data engineers today. But they are experts at going across those different databases, bringing it to the newer technologies, whether it's Hadoop or Cassandra or, or you know, with Spark or any of the other kind of newer technologies. They're an expert of getting it into a form where then you can run the analytics against it and creating processes to refresh it on a day-to-day -day basis. And we found that that's far easier than trying to create the giant data warehouse with a fully normalized data structure, which honestly 80% of the time doesn't actually work. 
And so those data management strategies with the more consumer-oriented technology in a big data context, we found to be far more effective, but we had to hire a different skill set to get it to actually operate. Gentleman right here. Same question. Okay. Maybe I can add. Uh, uh, please do. Yeah, may I point to one uh, excellent point Rick is uh, make. You know, obviously, you know, um, um, today when you look at the control systems or, or in manufacturing uh, uh, machines, that they they are generally a lot of data by themselves on a, on uh, on a, you know on a daily basis. Um, uh, how to connect all those data and uh, that has been accumulated and, and and perform batch analytic to gain insight to build the models as important as Rick has mentioned. However. Another aspect, as you're moving forward, um, uh, you may want to consider as well how to collect those data as they come in, as streaming, uh, as they're streaming in, and, and apply streaming analytics to them to gain more in-time insight into those data. I, I, I take the uh, leverage the, the model we can build using the batch analytic gather from the historic data, and and I think that another point, but please you know also uh, keep in mind as well. Um, more questions out here? You're going to force us to go on to the big question. All right, on we go. We got one, wait, we got one right over here. We, did, we haven't gotten to the big question yet. <laughs> this is a fairly good sized question, nonetheless. In the uh, keynote, Jack talked about the German EU approach to Industry 4.0 being a very structured and organized effort. Uh, whereas the U.S. North American approach was much more fragmented, uh, dig disjointed. Yes, the IIC is looking to bring some things. How do you guys, you, you know, participate in the two of those, or, or uh, how how are you encouraging a stronger approach for U.S. North America? Um, if you would just please comment on that. Sure. So from our perspective, we essentially have to. We look at the broad market, so we look at volume, we look at different devices. We join a lot of the different groups, standards groups that are out there. And honestly, we essentially have to find ways to adopt the standards that are out there on the protocol level. Uh, so whether it's, you know, Zigbee or whether it's, you know, um, MQTT, you know, at the protocol levels, all the way up through some of the more, I say, elaborate constructs that are being changed today, like B2MML or the ISA 95 type models that are changing. So we stay plugged into those standards organizations and essentially adopt manifestations of that inside of our software, either by way of interfaces or by way of design patterns or, or application uh, notes and things like that. Anybody else? Yeah, so I, I think it's a, it's a great question. I mean, we study Industry 4.0 quite a bit, and I think there's a lot of good things to learn from there. I mean, certainly the concept of the digital twin is, is paramount in some of the Industry 4.0. We've adopted that as a first-class citizen within GE. You know, just about every asset that we have, whether it's a customer's asset or our own, is digitally modeled somewhere. Maybe there's five or ten models of it. We're updating those models in real time and comparing the physical results to what the model tells us. I mean, that's inherent in the strategy. But on the other hand, you know, we put our center of excellence for software just outside of Silicon Valley in San Ramon. We hired 1,000 people ahead of the curve, software engineers largely, because we wanted that culture of try it, learn, fail fast, move forward, because we were exploring things that you know, hadn't been done before. And I think without that culture, you know, maybe we could have done it more efficiently, but we couldn't have done it as fast. And the speed is so paramount right now because of the rate of acceleration of change throughout all of our industries. The, the consumer space took about 12 years to completely change. I think industry is going to do it faster and it's going to be bigger. And so you have to be willing to disrupt yourself, you have to be willing to take some risk, and you have to be willing to fail fast. And so it may feel a little bit disorganized, but there's a lot of method to that madness in order to learn quickly and get the improvements in place. So, so let's go on to that, that final big question. For our audience, <clears throat> From each of your perspective, how is IIoT going to make manufacturing operations better, more efficient, safer? Shiwan? Um, I, I guess, you know, the, uh, to me, the one main theme is about um, enabling intelligent operations through um, analytic. And, and for manufacturers, I think, you know, first of all, you know, look at, you know, what are the, the, the um, uh, um, highest value you can deliver by applying this set of idea technology into your operations. 
and um, uh, start you know, uh, solving simple problems first and gradually involving your solution become more complete and more mature and provide bigger value. And uh, for analytic, for example, I just give example, right? You, you are collecting a lot of uh, uh, time series data from your machines. And, and at the beginning, you can look at how can I use the machine, how can I use the analytic to recognize pattern we human can recognize, but in a tedious, take time, so the machine can do a better job in terms of recognize this pattern faster uh, um, uh, for, for to inf keep us informed how things are running, right? Um, and then gradually move toward, you know, uh, into um, uh, 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 patterns that uh, may exist that we can think about. They may exist, but we very hard for us to recognize, right? And, and, and recognize patterns and, and take those insights back to your operation. Finally, uh, as we move on, become more sophisticated, uh, more mature in analytic, we may be even to recognize patterns we cannot even imagine exist and, and use those insight to feed back to your operation. So the idea is analytic is about gaining insight, uh, about optimizing your operation to reduce cost, increase input, improve quality, and, and increase safety, for example, as well for your worker. So, so uh, I think you know, the theme, you know, keep in mind, to me, is really important. Is, uh, what is important is keeping the analytic in your, in, your, in your mind in terms of approaching the, uh, uh, the industrial internet um, and, and, and have your long-term vision uh, driving your, um, uh, uh, your operations and uh, gradually implement this uh, uh, technology into your operation to provide values to, to your uh, business. Rob, you spend a lot of time with operations and asset management sure. from your perspective. Yeah. Th th this, is, this is really where a lot of this is headed. Yeah, I, I think if I had to try and try and summarize, you know, we talked all about you know, devices and platforms and connectivity, and that stuff's all anti in the game. What's going to make the biggest difference, I think, is a couple things. One is um, I think we'll finally be able to actually close the proverbial loop. I know as engineers and control engineers, we talk about you know, closed loop control. Um, but forever, we've talked about kind of supply chain material management all the way down through manufacturing of widget X or operating plant or facility YZ. And that loop between those different systems has, has frankly never ever been closed. And I think that's what's going to be enabled by this. And there's going to be a tremendous amount of value that is unlocked and tremendous amount of cost out that can be achieved by closing the loop between manufacturing, what you produce, how you produce it, and the business and the commercial side of how these, these organizations and businesses are actually run. You know, as an example, I mentioned how Schneider's using our own stuff to, to, to tie into our electromechanical equipment. That goes all the way up into our, our CRM systems with partners like, um, uh, like Salesforce, where we can actually start to look at who's using our stuff, how are they using it. And then it begins to be something you can feed back into your design, the actual design of the manufactured objects and, and equipment and machinery that you make. And so for me, closing the loop is one big piece of that, literally from the design side um, material management side, warehousing, planning side, all the way down through production and manufacturing. I think the other thing that gets lost a little bit in the sort of sea of acronyms and technology is the people side of this. Everyone wants to talk about machines and devices and platforms and tech, but at the end of the day, this allows a lot of people to do their jobs way more effectively uh, than they have before. Remote field workers, uh, maintenance techs, business ops, business leads, I mean, it essentially becomes an enable for everyone to do their job way more efficiently. So there's just a couple perspectives I would add. Absolutely. And Rich, you get the last word on this. Sure. So, you know, I, I think uh, it's well known that when we got connected, we were able to take smarter actions. No question about it. The fact that we're, you know, surrounded by this ambient intelligence in our day-to-day -day life makes us capable of, you know, stepping outside of an airport, hitting the Uber button and the location and getting a, a ride transparently. That doesn't happen because my phone's smart. That happens because there's 100,000 servers back behind me that are doing the crunching to make that happen. We're absolutely convinced that connected equipment, connected plants, and connected enterprise are going to go through that same kind of change. So for example, no question we can eliminate unplanned downtime. We do that with the large scale assets today, without question. That eliminates a complete disruption in the way the plants are run today. We're finding we can get 7 to 15 percent efficiency at the equipment level from a performance standpoint. Those are big numbers. It's far more than the power of 1 percent that GE has talked about. I mean, that's real optimization down at the, at, at the equipment level. We're finding we can get you know, 15 to 30 percent plant throughput efficiency just within the context of the plant through some of these IoT initiatives. 
And we have another program we call the digital thread. I don't know if that's something that you've heard, but really it's all about saying the design systems can't be separate from the manufacturing systems, which can't be separate from the maintenance and service systems. And you have to understand the connectivity between those because those right now are where handoffs occur and those handoffs are inefficient. And so we're doing a lot of work to say, how do I go from design to manufacturing with a push of a button and have my configuration for the manufacturing system pop out? And how does my service system operate a maintenance system based on you know, the bill of materials and the routes and everything else that's associated with my manufacturing system? And to Rob's point, how does the design team operate better because they can see the data in the operational information, understand if their equipment is hitting the design parameters, and bring that back into the next generation of design? And so I really see it changing all aspects of the manufacturing systems starting with getting connected and then using the advanced algorithms and digital twins to get insights and then finally to really start to optimize these processes. Uh, you, you, everybody's mentioned design. We could do a whole other day just on design, to, design to, to, to manufacture. So, but I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for their, uh, for their insights on this topic the, this afternoon. Thank you guys very much. Thanks.